before we start with the day's lectures, please note these important changes to Oral Pathology 360's programs and services. There's a change to the OP Tuesdays program format and the weekly live streams are being replaced by recorded lectures right till June 2023. Videos will be premiered at our usual time, that is, of course, 17.30 IST on Tuesdays. And you can watch them anytime after that. However, it will be great fun if you can join us and we can watch them together while they are being premiered. To find out more about the reasons for this change, please watch the Town Hall number 5, which was streamed on the 14th of March. There will also be a temporary interruption in our newsletter and information sharing services, both on email and WhatsApp. Also, I'm sad to say our weekly puzzles, which have been rather popular, are also going to be stopped for this duration. So to wrap up, OP Tuesdays will continue with recorded videos to the second half of May, when we have our summer vacations. Information about upcoming videos will be shared on our social media platforms on Mondays preceding the events. And to ensure that you get the information, do follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram using our page handle, which is at Oral Pathology 360. You can also stay connected and find out what's happening by going to our website, that's oralpathology360.com or the events page on the website. It is also possible very easily to subscribe right here to our channel so that you will know exactly when the events are coming up. Hit the subscribe button below each video or then hit the logo, hit our logo on the right lower corner of uh, the page that will also subscribe you to our channel. Having done that, make it a point to hit the bell icon and then choose all notifications. This ensures that you will get notified every time there is a new content on the channel. With that, let me end and say that at this time, it will also be very helpful to us if you can actively share the content with others while we are unable to. And uh, thank you again for understanding. We look forward to providing valuable content going forward. Well, enjoy the lecture. A lot of oral pathologists, I don't know how it is in India, but a lot of oral pathologists here don't see these cases. We see them in residency, and then we actually go to our dental schools or whatever, and we don't look at thyroids. I have been fortunate in my career to be in three large hospitals, all three of which had head and neck surgeons, ENT surgeons, who took care of the thyroids. So I'm going to show you some thyroids, because I think this is an area that we can benefit from discussion. Well, when I see large follicles with colloid, I have a pretty good idea where I'm at. I also get some, I get some um, intrathyroidal lymphoid tissue. So I know the patient has lymphocytic thyroiditis, at least mild. And I can see it's pervasive through a couple areas. This is very mild, but I have to be start thinking about the, the, the patient clinically of Hashimoto's, maybe. I also know, once I know the patient has lymphocytic thyroiditis, I have to start looking for a papillary carcinoma somewhere. That's a lesson I think we can all take here. Lymphocytic thyroiditis does have an association with higher rates of either pap micro papillaries or papillary carcinomas. But so far on low power, I'm pretty comfortable with the background stroma of this gland being, okay, it's thyroid gland. I know where I'm at. I see some cystic degeneration. That's not totally unusual, but I know I might be looking for something because now I've got here and here, it's somewhat histologically different. There's a pattern difference here. So I'm gonna start with the normal thyroid gland and go, okay, this is my baseline. This is what, I, what thyroid gland should look like. It should have round cells that are sort of uniform. Uh, even at this power, I'm not seeing a lot of evidence of optical clearing. I'm not seeing grooves. I'm not seeing pseudo inclusions. And I've got lots of colloid. Okay, good. I've got some normal um, control background. But now I'm gonna go into the area that was unusual. And I'm going to start looking at the features. And the first thing I notice is, oh, these are unusual. I'm starting to see hyperchromatism. I'm to starting to see very large cells. They're somewhat herthal in their appearance, but then there are some that have prominent nucleoli. So I'm not seeing grooves, but I certainly have to start thinking about it, either a papillary or a follicular carcinoma. And I'm going to start there. 
what am I looking for in a patient with background, a little bit of lymphocytic thyroiditis? I'm look, what I'm chasing down is do I see enough signs of a carcinoma? So I'm going to look at the lymphoid stroma, and that's about as beautiful as you get for lymphoid follicles, benign lymphoid follicles. And I'm starting to see a little bit of papillary structure here. Ah, so the plot thickens. So I'm going to start looking at these papillary structures. And now maybe the nuclei are starting to crowd a little bit. And then I'm going to look at these other papillary structures. Ah, now the plot thickens even further. But you know, I'm still seeing nuclear features that remind me for the most part of this. So I'm in a challenge zone here because I have structurally papillary structures. I have nuclear, not papillary. And then I have other areas with the same kind of papillary structures, but I don't have the nuclear features. And notice I've also got some sort of active sort of um, now secretion or resorption of the colloid. Okay, so what's, so what's the mystery I have to solve here? Because even in these areas with the follicular characteristics and these pseudopapillary structures, I just don't have the nuclear features. So why do I have a little few focal areas where it's very abnormal? So what's going to lead to abnormalities of nuclear features in, in thyroid? A lot of needles, right? So they get fine needle aspiration. So I have to find out, did the patient have a needle aspiration? That's number one. Number two, if they have a lot of herthal type cells, which they do here, very oxophilic, those can cause some abnormal nuclear features. And the third thing is besides, besides Hashimoto's, you can also have Graves' disease and patients get treated for their Graves' disease, which can cause these very large, very irregular, somewhat papillary structures. So now I have to think, do I have a papillary carcinoma? Do I have a um, a needle, uh, no, sort of a biopsy type abnormality, or do I have somebody who has had Graves' disease that's had some treatment? So I'll ask my learners, well, how do you tease this out? So there's some immunohistochemical stains you can do, there's some genetics you can do, or you can simply go into the patient's record or ask the, the ANT surgeon, what's their history? And the patient had Graves' disease with some lymphocytic thyroiditis, and the patient had radioactive iodine for it. So it, so it turns out in this case, it's the iodine that's forming the structural characteristics changes here, but not really altering the nuclei, but this sort of bubbling of colloid that's very common in treated graves and, and these abnormal nuclear features as a result of the radioactive iodine are also features of this. So when you look at the whole gland, and these are just pictures through the gland, sometimes it's not papillary carcinoma, those papillary features. So I wanted to show you a case of Graves' disease, and I have been very fortunate to see at least about a dozen Graves' cases. Now my eye is set to it. When I see these papillary structures, I, I don't reflex as quick, oh, it's just called papillary carcinoma. Now the treatment is probably the same for this patient. They're going to get a thyroidectomy, but what we know is probably not going to happen is they're probably not going to need any additional treatment other than, other than some thyroid hormone. That's important. So you don't want to call something a cancer simply because it has some features. So Graves' disease is, is something if you don't see, have it in your background mind. It may have some structural papillary features, but yes. not new. What I want to point out is, is when you see the nodule, you need to investigate the nodule, both grossly and and histologically. So the first thing I'm going to look for here is, does it look fairly well encapsulated? And the answer is yes. The second thing I need to do is I want to compare the background to this. Now, this is, this is one nodule. This is another nodule. And if you notice, there's a little bit of a difference between this nodule and this nodule, right? This one's a little bit more well-contained. This one's a little less well-contained. So I'm automatically going to be on the alert for, do I have something benign, something malignant, or both? So what I'm going to do is look all the way around the gland first. Just I want to see how the inked margin looks, and I'm pretty happy here, right? I got different color inks. I got green. I have some pseudopapillary structures. So I got to think, okay, is this a result of treatment? Is this a result of 
of fine needle aspiration, or am I going to find a cancer in here? So I do have some variation all the way around. That's just surgical hemorrhage. So I'm just looking, right? I've got some differences here, sort of microfollicular, macrofollicular. Okay, so let's look at the first nodule that has a somewhat of a capsule all the way around. And what I'm seeing here is a complete lack of nuclear features, right? I'm not seeing optical clearing. I'm not seeing pseudo inclusions. I'm not seeing grooves. What I'm seeing is somewhat more of an oxyphilic herthal cell appearance. So my thought process is this is probably one of the very common findings of a sort of adenomatoid or a folic or of a, a sort of an oxyphilic nodule, right? This happens a lot in patients. Said the guy was missing his left thyroid because I had an adenoma in my left thyroid. So that nodule, I'm not worried about, even in the context of these papillary structures. But look, yes, the nuclei are kind of crowding up a little bit. But remember, patients like this will have palpation, and they'll also potentially have to have needle aspirations of these things. And so these herthal cell features are fairly common in patients who have had some sort of biopsy or needle of these. But it's the other nodule that I really want to take a look at, because now I'm seeing papillary structures. And what you're going to see is now you're seeing some differences here. The first thing is there's a lot of papillary structures. And then you're also going to see when I start looking at the nuclear features, right? I see some streaming. I see some papillary features. I see some, some crush artifact. And notice as I go around, it's a little harder to discern. Oh, is this capsule starting to be invaded? So I have to start thinking about follicular neoplasms and I have to start thinking about papillary neoplasms. And so we're going to cut to the chase because now it's even you know, becoming a little less distinct. So I got to start looking at the high power features of this. So now what I think you're going to start noticing is that the nuclei are starting, they're not round anymore. They're sort of oblong. I'm going to start showing you what I can probably do here. Come on, see if this works. This is my fancy tool here. Oh, that looks like a pseudo inclusion to me. I'm going to blow this up to a thousand X. That looks like a pseudo inclusion. That looks like a bean, right? That's optically clear. So I'm starting to see actual nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. So we're going to go back to this. This is why I like showing this in PDF format because I can, I can magnify even further. And if I go into these areas, Right now, I'm really beginning to start to seeing nuclear features. And so I'm going to do this again. I do this a lot because I don't have a thousand X on my microscope. Right. But now I've got a lot of these features. Right. I've got some enlarged nucleoli. I've got optical clearing. I've got this, the, the nuclei are really kind of superimposed. They're invading each other's space. I have all the features of, and then I have sort of look like grooves. So I have all the features of papillary carcinoma. Why is that meaningful? Well, this patient already had a thyroidectomy, but if this was a hemithyroid, the patient probably, the patient may, may have a full thyroidectomy and might need to have some lymph node analysis. And then you start to see, you know, now even here, you'll start to see, okay, these are not round nuclei. These are not round nuclei. And you see that they're not producing as much colloid either. And then you have these streaming areas. So the question is, is how many, tall cells, do you have to call a tall cell? It's usually 30% of the gland. So this is not enough to call a tall cell. We're probably still in the usual variant here. And then once again, I can, even, even without blowing this up past 400, I can see, oh, there's optical clearing here with a lot of cells. And then you got this sort of you know, fibrotic collagenous stroma. I'm not seeing colloid here anymore. So it shouldn't surprise you that this was a papillary thyroid carcinoma. So when you're thinking about these cancers, what you're now obligated to do is you now have a cancer. So now I have to do, I don't know if you are following the College of American Pathologist guidelines in India, but here in the States or, or whatever country you're in, but generally speaking, people will follow CAP guidelines. And so you have to make a synoptic summary. Now I have a cancer. I have to define all the things like, is there perineural invasion? Is there multiple tumors? How big is it? Is the inked margin involved? Is it invaded outside the, the, the invaded outside the 
thyroid or the lymph nodes involved because that stages your cancers up. And so, you know, in this case, the tumor was very, fairly well contained. It was less than a centimeter. There were low lymph nodes. So it gets a PT1. So if this, if this was a hemithyroid, there is some literature to suggest that if the other, other lobe of the thyroid does not have any specific nodules on ultrasound, you could leave the other thyroid alone. Some surgeons will take the whole thyroid and obligate your patient to thyroid medications. All right, third case is an actual hemithyroid. I show you a very large nodule and I'm gonna go you all the way around. So the lesson I'm showing you here is what we're gonna be looking for is its capsular invasion, right? We're talking about follicular neoplasms, either benign or carcinomas. So on a low power view, I'm feeling pretty comfortable, although even though the, nut, the capsule is thin, it seems to be pretty well contained all the way around. I'm also seeing colloid in the center. I'm also seeing variation in the sizes of the, of the, the follicles. So all of these things are leading me towards a benign follicular neoplasm, at least on low power. So I'm feeling pretty comfortable. It looks fairly solid, but this is all solid tumor. So I'm going to start going a little bit higher. Now I'm going to start paying attention to the vessels. And we're going to talk about what constitutes vascular invasion. Um, I used to be really nervous and want to call everything vascular invasion. And they're like, you're overcalling your cases. So by a little bit of experience, and I'm not a thyroid specialist, but that vessel looks pretty clean and that vessel looks pretty clean. And the capsule is thick, but it looks pretty well uninvolved. And so I'm showing you some just some areas around the edges where the vessels outside the capsule are not involved. The capsule itself seems to be not involved. Even this little mushrooming here, I'm gonna show you the photo. So in this particular case, I'm gonna show you why this is actually not that worrisome. Even in a thin capsule like this, that vessel is actually inside the capsule. So if, the, if, if there's tumor here, that's part of the tumor itself. So all the way around, this is what I'm doing at at least 200X. I'm looking for vessels and I'm looking for invasion or mushrooming outside the capsule, and I'm not seeing it. Even this little bit here, if I were to level through this, I probably would see this eventually connect, right? This is still part of the capsule here. It's still inside the capsule. And even with this large vessel, what I'm looking for is not the tumor here. I'm looking for the tumor pushing through the wall. It has to be in the wall and in the lumen together. And I'm gonna show you that on the cap guidelines. So capsule is pretty well intact here. This is just probably just a large vessel or a large follicle. And I can, I see colloid that's being absorbed. So this is, you know, it's still doing what it does, right? This is the thyroid hormone that's being absorbed um, into the bloodstream. So even there's a little irregularity here, not too concerning. The blood vessel here is completely uninvolved. The wall is not invaded by this. This capsule is pretty well. This capsule is thin, but it still seems to be intact. Right, here's the tumor ending. This is just a little bit of normal. Even here, where I've got this node, this is where I start getting worried. But if I level through this, you can do additional levels. Most likely that will connect or this will completely disappear. Even here, right? It's worrisome, but it still seems to be contained within this capsule. Even here, where it seems to be separate, it probably joins right here but here's the capsule, and then here's an outside blood vessel. But I'm still seeing colloid. It's a little inspissated. Sorry, my, my tissue, my technician folded it a little bit here. It happens. When I look in the center, now I start looking for the nuclear features, right? So there's no papillary features here. This is just macrofollicular and microfollicular. Yes, the nuclei are kind of enlarged, right? It's, it's an adenoma of some sort, um, but it's still producing colloid. And in other areas, I can see, well, now I'm back to kind of, oh, yeah, they're large, but they still kind of have that round nuclear feature, more typical of a follicular thing than a papillary thing. And even in the areas where it looks like it wants to push through, they still have a fairly round. This blood vessel is actually part of the tumor. I used to think this was capsular invasion, uh, this was vessel invasion, and no, you know, then I'd, I'd get frustrated, and then, you know, they would actually yell at me and say, well, you know, you're overcalling this, or we'd send the case out. Microfollicles, a little bit of colloid. You can get clear cell features. You can get herthal cell features, especially if the patients have fine needle aspiration, where have had palpation of their thyroid. You can get palpation thyroiditis. 
So these are the areas where I showed you where the, the tumor looks like it's getting close to the capsule. This is when I'll go to 400X and going, okay, what I'm looking for is groups or nests of cells that are sitting in the wall of the vessel. And they're not here. So I'm gonna sort of discount this. And now you look at a large muscular artery in the capsule, completely devoid of tumor. And so where am I gonna go? I'm gonna go with follicular adenoma with Herthel and clear cell changes. And whenever you do a, a hemi or a total thyroid, look for parathyroid glands. We're kind of obligated to report those. So what we're trying to do here is rule out follicular carcinomas. Now, in the CAP guidelines, there are some genetic tests that you can do, and I'd have to look them up to tell you. But there's things like BRAF, PAX PPA or gamma, RAS, HRAS, depending on which combination. But unfortunately, some of those genetic changes can actually show up in benign thyroid as well. So this is what I captured from the CAP guidelines. And you can go to the College of American Pathology um, website and download this. You see there's actually a lot more no's than there are yeses. So all of these things that I mentioned before, it looks like there's a little bit of mushrooming in the capsule. There's even a little bit of tumor nests in the capsule. In, uh, as long as it's not physically mushroomed out the capsule or pushed completely out the capsule or pushed the capsule with it. So there's only what? There's there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's only 30% of these qualify as yes, this is invasive follicular neoplasm. Now you call it a carcinoma. So I think, I guess the good news, and it's based on large studies that show it's only these, these, and these that tend to have untoward outcomes and need additional therapy. And that's usually going to be radioactive iodine or something of that nature. Vessels, almost all of these, and this is where I used to be very, very nervous about this. The only time that you actually consider to have vessel invasion is if it, it has, the tumor has to be attached to the wall of the vessel, and it's supposed to actually have some sort of clot or, or, or platelet clot or some sort of you know, um, embolism or inside this. So you have to have that. All this other stuff, if it's just sitting in there, it's probably artifact. So even this is not considered capsule invasion. Now, I will tell you in cases like if I have a case like this or if a case like this, uh, by definition, all of our thyroids here require two signatures. We've just, just determined that it's better to have two people look at that, even for the benign ones, even for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I never sign these cases out by myself. I've, I've, we also have four oral pathologists here, but I can also get a general pathologist. The cytopathologists are pretty good at this too. And we can take questions on thyroid. So I'm looking to see questions. Yeah, Lots questions. of questions and comments here. What could be the histogenesis of salivary gland tumors? Um, uh, I think it's a genetic, probably a genetic abnormality. You know, this is what happens. You know, cells divide and they sort of go awry. Sometimes they go awry benign and sometimes they go awry malignant. But I think as we're finding a lot of these, you know, these translocations, these genes, it's just, you know, when you take two chromosomes and you crisscross them, you switch them next to each other, what are you doing? You're translocating one gene from one another. And a lot of these are enzymes that get put next to each other. And then the enzymes are sort of constitutively turned on. And they're the enzymes that tell your cells, divide, go forth. And so I think that's probably what we're finding in most of these tumors is they're just genetic changes that constitutively activate the, the, the reproductive machinery of the cells. Um, let's see, what panel of IOC markers do you see? I think we talked about that for blue cell tumors. Um, does the capsule invasion diagram for thyroid hold true for lymph nodes as well? Um, so in terms of extra nodal extension, if that's the question, Dr. Priyanka, uh, I, I, I think of it the same way. I don't think the CAP defines it the same way, but, but there are some guidelines for extra nodal extension because you, know, you typically tend to have a capsule around um, the node. But in my mind, I, I think if it's, I, I would probably treat it the same way. Right. If there's, if there's, you know, if the capsule around the, the lymph, sometimes lymph nodes don't have a capsule. So if I see it physically going out the capsule, what you have is, an, is a nice juxtaposition. What's usually around the lymph node is fat. And so optically, it's very easy to tell tumor from fat. The problem I have is when you have, you know, you have the, um, 
the cortex and the medulla in a lymph node. So the cortex has a lot of histiocytes in it. And so sometimes the histiocytes can look like epithelial cancer. And so if you're, if you're ever not sure, if you know what the immunohistochemical panel for the primary tumor is, so if I'm thinking about a thyroid tumor in a lymph node, just do a thyroglobulin, right? You can just do a thyroid stain. And if you see that positive in the lymph node or outside the lymph node, that's an easy way to do it. Now we understand that costs money, right? I'm sure everywhere in India, including, right? Dollars here, rupees where you are, right? So it doesn't matter, it costs money. But I think if you really want the answer for the patient for therapy, I think that's money that's well spent. And I think, you know, I think your patients, even though, look, I, I know, I mean, I know what the poverty rates are in India, right? So, but I think if it's somebody's life at stake, I think it's unfortunate that medicines become a business. But at the same time, I think we owe it to our patients. I really need to solve that mystery. So I would say, yes, anything. So even salivary tumors, right? The whole concept of carcinoma X mixed tumors, there's rules and guidelines about, is it contained within a capsule? Even if it's less than eight millimeters outside the capsule, sometimes that's not a problem. So I would treat them all the same way. How frequent are thyroid tissue metastasis into oral mucosa and jaw bones? Um, I have yet to see a... I have I've yet to see a thyroid metastasis to the jaw bones in my practice. I think I saw like two of them in residency. So it's not it's not one of the common ones, but I learned I learned when I was in residency, um, how do you figure out what tumors metastasize to the oral cavity? And I learned uh, it's a BLT with a cold kosher pickle. Breast, lung, thyroid, colon, kidney, prostate. So the answer is yes, thyroid does can metastasize. I just haven't seen a lot of them. Most common, the most common metastasis that I've seen so far in the oral cavity, I think probably in my residency was renal. That's been the most common ones that I've seen in the head and neck is renal cancers. Uh, after that, probably what you would expect, typical breast and prostate. Great questions. Mm -hmm.